Hello there, good afternoon and welcome again to the Communication and Signal Processing Seminar. This is our penultimate uh, CSP seminar for this uh, semester. We have one more next week. So first I want to thank uh, again, as always, Kate Goodwin and uh, Shelley Falcon for doing all the hard work behind the scenes and also the research area for supporting. Uh, so I'm uh, delighted to introduce our speaker today, Vidya Mukhukumar. She's an assistant professor in the schools of uh, electrical and computer engineering, as well as industrial and systems engineering at Georgia Institute of Technology. Her broad interests are in game theory, uh, online and statistical learning. She's particularly interested in the designing learning algorithms that provably adapt in strategic environments, um, studying the fundamental properties of overparameterized models and fairness, accountability, and transparency in machine learning. She received her PhD in electrical engineering and computer science uh, from the University of California, Berkeley. She's a recipient of the Simons Berkeley Research Fellowship for the Fall 2020 program on the theory of reinforcement learning, the IBM Science for Social Good Fellowship, and the Georgia Tech Class of 1969 Teaching Fellowship for the academic year of 2021 and 2022. So, with that, I'll uh, give the floor to Vidya. Uh, I will be monitoring chat. Um, typically, we allow people to ask questions whenever they want to interrupt, if that's okay with you. Sounds great. Um, thank you, Vijay, for the nice introduction. It's, um, it's wonderful to be virtually visiting. Uh, please stop me at any point in time if you're not able to hear me or if you have any clarifying questions or other types of questions about uh, what I'm going to be presenting today. Uh, so it's my pleasure to be uh, giving the seminar and uh, today I'll be talking about uh, some new results that we obtained for the situation of overparameterized linear classification. So this is a joint work um, with a wonderful set of collaborators. Um, so I want to acknowledge uh, Misha Belkin, Daniel Su, uh, and Anand Sahai, the and uh, Christos Tampolis, the um, fellow faculty in this project. Um, and also especially shout out to the student collaborators on this project. Um, that's Adhyan Narang, who's a PhD student now at University of Washington. Um, I worked with him on these projects when he was an undergraduate at Berkeley. Uh, Vignesh Subramanian, who is a senior graduate student at Berkeley. Uh, Kay Wang, who uh, is Christoph Trampel, that is his PhD student. And uh, Jisoo, who is Daniel Su's student. So uh, thanks to all of them, this has been a great collaborative effort spanning now a couple of years. So the very high level motivation um, for what I'm gonna be discussing today um, is the fact that state-of-the-art neural networks uh, predominantly operate in this very over-parameterized regime. Um, and what I mean by that is that the number of parameters in the model uh, greatly exceeds the number of uh, training examples um, an example over here that's pictured uh, is taken from this well-known work of Zhang et al., uh, which appeared recently in Communications of the ACM, uh, where the accuracy of various models was evaluated on the CIFAR-10 test data set. Um, this is a popular image classification benchmark that comprises of 50,000 training points. And as you can see in the table here, all of the models that achieve state-of-the-art performance um, are heavily over-parameterized. That is the number of parameters is in the order of the millions. Uh, moreover, all of these models are actually capable of achieving zero training error or 100% training accuracy. That is, they perfectly fit or interpolate their training data. And uh, despite this phenomenon being traditionally associated with overfitting, they also achieve extremely good classification accuracy. So these findings, um, these empirical findings first appeared in the literature about five years ago. Um, they spawned a lot of activity and interest in understanding what exactly was underlying this uh, very good generalization performance. Um, and there are kind of two separate threads of work that I will not really be focusing on today, but I'm happy to take questions about offline. Um, the first one is kind of the question of how we get to the zero training error number in the first place. Um, that's a question of independent interest, uh, especially because training of neural networks involves a lot of non-convex optimization. Uh, so very interesting lines of work there have shown that over parameterization does help us achieve zero training error in an easier way. A kind of separate question 
um, that I'm also not really going to be focusing on today is the type of solution that achieves zero training error that is actually found. So for example, if we run gradient descent um, and try to train a neural network, there are many different solutions that achieve zero training error. The question arises of which of those solutions actually arises in practice. Um, and a kind of a typical uh, type of result in this space shows that a gradient descent tends to converge to solutions with a minimum two norm bias. So the weights of the model are ideally going to be as small as possible in their L2 norm, subject to this constraint of achieving zero training error in data. So today we will be talking about solutions of this kind of minimum two norm bias, but in relatively simpler settings compared to the case of neural networks. So today's talk is really going to be focused on the third kind of piece of this puzzle, uh, which is the question of whether these types of solutions with a minimum two norm bias, in fact, do generalize well. And the stage for this talk is actually going to be set in a surprisingly simple model class compared to the set of neural networks. And this is the setting of the overparameterized linear model. Um, so a lot of interest has kind of been reignited in the setting. Um, and really kind of inspired by the more recent work by uh, Misha Belkin, Daniel Su, and uh, their students. And uh, this, appear, this work appeared in uh, the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences about uh, now three years ago. Um, and their main finding actually was that this benefit of overparameterization does not only occur for neural networks, um, it also can be observed in these kind of linear model settings. So the schematic figure on this slide um, essentially plots the regression mean squared error as a function of the number of parameters in a linear model. And it considers the evolution of this mean squared error as a function of the number of parameters, both in the classical underparameterized regime and in this more modern overparameterized regime. And in this figure, there are parts of this figure that um, you would expect. So in the underparameterized regime, you see the classical U-shaped bias variance trade-off. Uh, the bigger surprise comes up in the overparameterized regime, where we see that the error starts to kind of go down as a function of the number of parameters when this kind of particular solution is picked, that is the minimum two-norm interpolation of noisy data. Now, there are many reasons that um, we might expect this to be surprising. You know, the benefit of adding the number of parameters is very kind of non-standard behavior. Um, but perhaps when I first saw this, what I found most surprising was the fact that we were perfectly fitting noisy data and this seemed to not be hurting performance all that much. And accordingly, a significant portion of the talk today is going to be focused on understanding that particular phenomenon. Um, just to say a little bit more about how we get this minimum two norm interpolation, um, you can definitely compute this in closed form. Um, but just to reiterate, this is also obtained in practice by running gradient descent on the squared loss. So keeping this motivation in mind, um, today's talk is going to be centered around better understanding various phenomena and properties in this overparameterized linear model. Um, the bulk of the talk will be focused on the classification setting, um, but I will first start off with a quick review of the regression setting where we have real valued output and we want to understand how um, choosing overparameterized models and perfectly fitting training data actually impacts regression error. And we'll see a number of interesting results here that uh, are by now um, kind of well known that show that it is in fact possible to perfectly fit noise and yet perform well in regression tasks. For the rest of the talk, we will then use the kind of underpinnings of this phenomenon to uncover a couple of surprises in the case of the classification talk. And for the classification setting, we will, under, we will basically analyze two different types of solutions. Uh, one is a kind of interpolating solution, and the second is a more popular model that's used in practice, which is the support vector machine. And through the course of this talk, we'll see some surprising connections between these uh, traditionally considered very different models. Um, so I'm happy to dive into things further from here, but um, I'm also happy to take questions about the motivation, if anyone has them. Vidya, I have just a simple question. Um, so naively, the number of parameters in a regression model is just determined by the dimension 
of the input space. So what do you mean by varying the number of parameters? Oh, I mean the dimension of the feature space. Um, so I'll make this very clear in, in my very next slide. Oh, but so how is it a fair comparison of test accuracy if the feature space, I guess you'll, you'll probably clarify that as well. Yeah, I think I think once we move on to the next slide, okay. this distinction it, it's a, it's a it's a good distinction to bring up between the input and the feature space. Um, gotcha. But I I do get to that in the very next slide. Uh, perfect. If we don't have any other questions, I'm happy to move on. I'm sorry, I think my slide seems to have uh, yeah, frozen again. Yeah. I'm sorry. sorry about that. Um, what I'm actually going to do is uh, I might have to restart the presentation. Oh, maybe it works now. OK, yeah, I, I think we can continue. Um, sorry about that. OK. Uh, so uh, just to begin with the first part of the review, um, I'm going to set up some basic notation for a, a linear model in this context. So in a typical linear model, um, the output that is uh, denoted by y here is a real valued. And uh, we're going to assume that the output was actually generated by a linear model. Excuse me. So um, what I mean by that is we can write y is equal to um, the features, um, which are dimension b. Uh, inner producted with a true parameter, which is the signal, and this is typically unknown to us a priori, uh, plus some additive noise. Um, and we're going to, throughout the talk, assume that this noise is of some kind of Gaussian or sub Gaussian variety, and uh, the variance is equal to sigma squared. Um, without loss of generality, we're also going to uh, center the, the feature vector. And um, a quantity that's going to pop up again and again throughout this talk is going to be the second order information about this feature vector. Um, that is the covariance matrix. So uh, just to say a little bit about the types of features um, that I'm going to be discussing in the talk today. Um, a lot of the theoretical initial theoretical results that we got for the setting um, made this assumption of independent uh, independent kind of components in the feature. So um, I think uh, like the question that was asked a few minutes ago kind of um, illustrated, uh, there are many different types of feature maps that we can consider in this model. Um, we could consider phi of x to simply be x, in which case the data is itself uh, d-dimensional and is over parameterized with respect to the number of training points. Um, but we could also consider uh, feature maps that are more of a lifted nature, um, where the input is kind of one dimensional and uh, phi of x may constitute the first D eigenfunctions of, say, uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Um, and very, very simple examples that I'm actually going to use as illustrative examples to this talk uh, will be the cases of like Fourier polynomials or Legendre polynomials or Hermite polynomials. So um, the focus of this talk is going to be in this over parameterized setting, um, where the number of features D is much greater than the number of samples that is N. Uh, so as we know in this setting, uh, once we set up our basic least squares regression problem, um, under very, very mild assumptions on the input data, um, the training data matrix A is typically going to be full rank. And what that means is that uh, once we set up the system of linear equations, that is A beta equals Y, um, that has infinitely many solutions that perfectly fit or interpolate the training data. So I'm going to use this word interpolation throughout the talk. And what I mean by that is simply that we are able to find a solution that perfectly fits all of the training data points. And this is really um, regardless of whether there's noise in the training data points or not. Um, it really just is a property of the input data matrix given by A. So um, in this setting, since there are infinitely many interpolating solutions and we want to understand um, the kind of test error properties of an interpolating solution, it's important to specify which particular type of solution we are trying to study. So our focus today is going to be on the setting of the minimum L2 norm interpolator, 
Um, and that simply constitutes the type of solution that perfectly fits training data, that is A beta equals Y, um, and is as small as possible in terms of the sum of the squares of the weights. And uh, maybe just an interesting uh, thing to note about this is that the solution is in fact equivalent to um, a ridge regularized empirical risk minimization, uh, where the kind of proportion of regularization relative to the training error goes all the way to zero. So you're in fact interpolating your training data. Um, another nice fact about this minimum two norm interpolation, which actually turns out to underlie a lot of the analysis in this space, is the fact that beta hat can typically be expressed in closed form. So um, the kind of substance in a lot of the recent uh, results in this space is to actually show that interpolation of noise need not be that harmless. And this is especially not all that harmful in settings where we are heavily over parameterized with respect to the number of training data points. Uh, phrased yet another way, the effect of fitting noise, the overfitting effect of fitting noise decreases and becomes less and less harmful the more and more we over parameterize the model. So what I'm now going to do is uh, just show you a very, very simple example that makes this kind of phenomenon very concrete. So let's consider a very simple setting where we have um, one dimensional data and uh, nine training examples. Uh, so let's say that these are noisy samples of, uh, of kind of a linear function. So um, the, the kind of actual training data points are marked in black and you can kind of see them in the figure over here. Um, and what you can see, uh, this is you know, something you might see in, in an introductory machine learning class. Uh, if you were to kind of do polynomial regression in an under parameterized setting, that is only considering polynomials of degree up to one, uh, then you would get the function fit that is kind of marked in blue over here. And um, this is achieving, you know, it's not achieving zero training error. It's not fitting the data perfectly, um, but it is doing pretty well in terms of test error. It's a pretty faithful fit to the data. And uh, the curve in green on the other hand, kind of is your classic textbook example that shows you why you should not perfectly fit training data. Um, the green function fit does actually perfectly interpolate the training data. Um, but it's clearly, you know, heavily overfitting the data. And um, if you were to just compute the test error on this kind of a, on a function, you would actually see it doing a lot worse. So now we're going to do something that seems a little bit crazy on the face of it. We're going to take this simple example and we're going to heavily over parameterize. Um, we're going to uh, basically consider polynomial fits um, for the case where uh, polynomials can be of degree up to 40. And we're going to ask if we can still, in fact, uh, if we still, in fact, see this really harmful overfitting effect. So the figure that I've plotted over here actually uh, constitutes, and I'm not going to get into the details of this yet, but I'm going to share them with you in just a few moments, um, the best case scenario. So what if we'd looked at all possible 40 degree polynomials that perfectly fit this data, and then we consider the best possible fit out of all of them? And the function that you get out of that is the function that is marked in red on this figure. And what you can actually see over here is that um, this is actually doing a lot better than the degree eight fit. Note that if, you know, in the case of degree eight, that is the case where D is equal to N and there's a unique solution that fits the training data. So that's a situation where you really cannot do a lot better. But what this figure basically shows us is that as we over parameterize more and more, we can in fact find certain interpolations that are not quite as harmless as what we would get if we had less over parameterization. So just to make this even more concrete, um, for the same example, the figure on the right plots the test mean squared error for a regression task as a function of the number of features, which in this example is the degree of the polynomial fit. Um, and on the left, you kind of see that as you approach uh, D equals N, where N is equal to nine, you see that you're overfitting more and more and more. Um, but now as we go from to the case where D is greater than N and D over parameterize more and more, we see that it is possible to interpolate noise without 
having a very heavy overfitting effect. So in other words, the test that I will see decays as a function of the number of features. So a very concrete uh, kind of theoretical scaling that we can obtain here is of the following kind. So we showed that with high probability on training samples, um, this type of minimum two-num interpolation achieves a test MSE. Um, that basically the consequence of interpolating noise in terms of mean squared error um, decays at this very simple weight, which is the number of samples divided by the number of parameters or the number of the number of features in the model. And there's also a natural proportionality to the noise variance, which is sigma squared. Um, so something I want to mention here is that uh, this phenomenon was concurrently discovered by a number of authors in 2019. Um, I'm not going to have time to really go into the contributions of all of these papers, um, but what I'm actually going to do in my quick review of all of these results is uh, say a little bit about our own results, which uh, kind of explained this phenomenon through a signal processing perspective. And I'm also going to uh, talk about the results that were obtained by Bartlett, Long, Lugosi, and Sickler, um, because we actually built on some of these results to study the classification setting. Cool. Um, did anybody have a question? I think I heard something. Okay, uh, so what I wanna do through the next couple of slides is um, give you a very elementary picture um, that kind of explains why we are able to get to this phenomenon of interpolating noise in a relatively harmless way. Um, so I'm gonna consider this really, really kind of tar case uh, where we have regularly sampled one dimensional data um, and we wanna try and fit it with a set of orthonormal Fourier features um, and I'm also going to consider, like, I guess you can think of it not exactly as noise, but um, you can think of these points as kind of dispersed and they turn out to um, be perfectly fitable by a pure sinusoid. So if we think of these points as like noise um, and we want to avoid overfitting them, um, the ideal fit is marked in black on the slide here. So we'd ideally like to be as close to zero as possible everywhere. So um, the figure in blue here constitutes an example of essentially a harmful interpolation. That is um, something that would perfectly fit the data and would kind of overfit it. Um, and this is clearly very far away from zero everywhere. So now we can think about what happens if we start to over parameterize. And the first kind of key classical observation here is that in the setting, um, if we over parameterize, we are effectively undersampling the data. And uh, what that essentially means is that there are many, many, many um, multiple aliases that can, in fact, perfectly fit these um, training data points. So in addition to the kind of sinusoid, which is the first thing that you would expect to think of candidate functions for interpolating this data, there are many, many high-frequency aliases that also perfectly fit this data. So that's our first key observation. Um, and also the number of these um, kind of orthogonal aliases that we have will also grow with the extent of over parameterization in the model. Our second observation is that if we were to choose a minimum two-norm interpolation, um, just because we wanna try and minimize the weights on, on each of the features that we're choosing, um, a simple connection to Passover's theorem in a DSP actually tells us that the function fit that we would get would equally weight all of these high frequency aliases and the resulting function is marked in red over here. And uh, what we really see is that this is now uh, an interpolation that is nowhere near as harmful as either the blue or the red interpolation. Um, so this is a function fit that is in fact very close to zero everywhere. So um, this very kind of elementary picture um, sort of gives you a flavor for why it is possible and why minimum two-norm interpolation together with a large amount of over parameterization helps us find these function fits that are not actually overfitting the noise. And you can really see it with the visually with the kind of red function and what it's doing here. It's kind of spiking up to um, meet all of the noise points, but it's really kind of hanging out to zero almost everywhere. Um, something else I'll mention about this figure um, 
uh, just you know because I need to say it, uh, is the fact that of course you know all of these observations are very exact under this very time model where you have regularly uh, sampled data, and uh, the output is kind of structured in this in this special way. Um, in real life, you have random data and therefore random features. And uh, the proofs of the main result that, that I kind of showed a few slides ago, um, kind of, you know, this is kind of really what's at the heart of it, but the details of those proofs really use random matrix theory. And, um, and what ends up happening a lot is looking at properties like the least singular value of n by d random matrices where d is much uh, larger than n. Cool. Uh, so maybe one last thing that I would like to say about this figure um, is what, what it kind of shows you is the flip side of what happens when we uh, do minimum two norm interpolation in, in these kind of settings um, and kind of a reminder of why we often do not use L2 regularization very classically in these over parameterized settings. Um, and just to kind of uh, remind you of the basic setup here, um, we have this regularly sampled 1D data and, we're con and effectively what ends up happening here is that the covariance matrix of the features becomes uh, isotropic. And uh, if we kind of flip this figure around on its head and we instead think of the output as arising from a signal, uh, from a pure signal, now the kind of zero fit is very undesired and the blue sinusoid um, kind of fit is what we really want. And from that point of view, the recovered signal is really kind of bad. It's kind of hanging out towards zero almost everywhere just as before. And um, what, what I guess I'm trying to say is that this red function fit is really good from the point of view of avoiding the overfitting of noise, but it's not quite as good from the point of view of preserving the signal in, in the output. Um, so there's this kind of very inherent trade-off that arises in the over parameterized regime if you're considering interpolating solutions between absorbing the noise in the problem and preserving the signal in the problem. I'll also add that from the point of view of signal recovery, this is not a new phenomenon. Um, this is very well known in statistical signal processing, and uh, this actually spurred the kind of um, this kind of spurred motivation to look at. Uh, different types of regularization, which are more parsimonious in nature and trying to encourage faster solutions. So um, these slides kind of give a nice picture um, in the setting where we have isotropic data, that is um, the covariance matrix of the features is simply the identity. Um, and they also suggest that this is really not the modeling assumption under which we want to be studying L2 regularization. So um, just to conclude my review of some of the recent results in this space, um, what I'm going to do here is introduce a more sensible model for studying L2 regularization. Um, and there's a sense in which the kind of modeling assumptions that I made here are really connected both to spiked covariance models, um, where it makes sense to try and estimate covariance matrices even in high dimensional settings. And this is also spiritually connected to the study of minimum Hilbert normal interpolations in a uh, function space. So um, essentially what we wanna do here is uh, construct a mechanism whereby we are still able to preserve the signal in the problem. And uh, to do that, we will fundamentally consider anisotropic covariance matrices. Um, and what I mean by that is if we uh, we'll basically consider diagonal covariances, that is sigma is gonna be a diagonal matrix, but we'll have non-uniform weights on each of the feature components. So in particular, the first S of the feature components will be much higher than the remaining D minus S. Um, and the way by which we'll capture that is we'll have as a parameter of this model, the ratio between the kind of higher weighted features and the lower weighted features. So there are really kind of, so this is, this is um, what we call a bi-level covariance model. Um, this appears in a lot of analyses of these types of high dimensional models in the literature, like I mentioned. Um, for the purpose of this talk, what I'll do is I'll basically define four parameters that we will vary, and I'll state a lot of the results for um, this talk as a function of these parameters. So starting with n, which is the number of samples, uh, d, which is the number of features in the model, 
S, which is the effective kind of sparsity level in, in, in the model in the sense that only the first S features are very upweighted and the rest D minus S are very, very small. And uh, the ratio between these two feature levels, which is uh, given by R. And the kind of intuition over here is that um, basically um, because the first S features are very upweighted, um, we want to try and find weights that are as small as possible in the two norm. And because the, the features, the first S features are kind of larger in magnitude, um, this is going to bias us towards finding weights that are um, that tend to weight the first S features a lot more because we can uh, kind of have much smaller weights and we can make up a function recovery that is kind of very, that, that is um, very significantly comprised of the first S components. Um, alternatively, you can view this as a minimum weighted L2 norm interpolation um, where the first S features are upweighted. So essentially, this kind of um, this what this does is it does a kind of implicit feature prioritization, where it really kind of incentivizes us to choose weights that are more on the first S features and less on the last D minus S. So just to mention a couple of uh, kind of connections between this model and uh, some others that people study in a statistical learning context. Um, so one common example here would be in these types of uh, weak features models where uh, each of the feature components are kind of identically distributed and a noisy copy of an underlying function. Um, and this is kind of an example that arises, for example, in, like, ra in uh, random Fourier features and approximations to kernel machines. And uh, the second example that arises very naturally is in linear discriminant analysis, um, where this kind of ratio between the two, uh, two feature levels corresponds to a type of signal to noise ratio in these problems. That is the ratio of the signal to uh, the kind of noise in, in the value C here. So um, even if all of that went a little bit fast, the, the very high level thing that I want to say here is that uh, we will be studying the properties of minimum L2 norm interpolation for the rest of this talk, but we'll be doing it in this setting where um, we consider anisotropic covariance matrix of the data. And we have this implicit feature prioritization mechanism whereby the top S features are upweighted relative to the bottom D minus S. And uh, that's gonna be a very, very important thing to keep in mind uh, for interpreting the results for the rest of this talk. Uh, so that kind of concluded my uh, brief review on uh, understanding the consequences of interpolating noise in a regression setting. Um, and for the rest of the talk, I'll actually be talking about the classification setting. Um, but before that, I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. I don't think there are any questions as, as far as I can see. Okay. Uh, and everyone, and you can all still hear me, correct? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so if there are no questions about that, um, what I'll actually do is I'll just go ahead and say a little bit about the classification setting. Um, so I'm going to use a lot of the same notation that I use for the regression setting. Um, and what's really going to change here is um, the label model. So um, just to start off with a very simple case, um, I'm going to consider what's uh, commonly called the random classification noise model, um, where we assume an underlying parameter beta star, which is the signal, um, just as before, uh, but now we have binary valued labels. So um, the label is going to be equal to the sign of this kind of uh, uh, inner product between phi of x and beta star. Um, and there's going to be some probability that is new of a label flip. So that's a good thing to keep in mind for uh, the kind of model here. Um, our theory can also deal with uh, kind of more general link functions for the label model as a function of phi of x transpose beta star. So we can, we can deal, for example, with uh, the logistic model for this. Uh, just as before, just to refresh some of the assumptions, um, the features are going to be centered. And uh, we'll continue to look at this feature covariance matrix given by sigma. And we'll also continue to look at the over-parameterized regime. 
So um, to kind of start off, the first type of solution that we look at here is um, exactly as before, a minimum two norm interpolation. Uh, so that's minimizing beta two subject to perfectly fitting the output labels. So there are some conceptual senses in which this is kind of a different object to look at in classification vis-a-vis uh, -vis the regression setting. Um, one is the fact that you know this is a somewhat non-standard um, estimator to really analyze in the context of classification. Um, and the reason is really because unlike in a regression setting, um, the true parameter beta star would not in fact interpolate binary labels, even in a situation where we have no label noise. Um, and that's something that you can ponder over, think about a little bit. Um, but there are really a few senses in which this is a kind of non-standard object to be studying here. So in some senses, the fact that it does well is kind of surprising. Uh, just to say a little more about uh, what we're going to do um, for the kind of first part of our classification results, what we're going to do is actually look at this type of a solution, the minimum two num interpolation, and directly compare its performance on a regression task and on a classification task. So just to review, in a regression setting, what we really care about is the test mean squared error. Um, that is, we look at the prediction given by phi of x transpose beta hat and compare it with phi of x transpose beta star, and we really want the real valued outputs to be as close to each other as possible. And that's kind of what the MSE tries to capture. On the other hand, in classification, what we really care about is getting the sign of the prediction right. So we look at phi of x transpose beta hat, um, we look at the sign of that that gives us one or minus one, and we want the sign of that to agree as far as possible with phi of x transpose beta star. And I'm also going to talk a lot over the next few slides about um, a notion of good generalization. And uh, to be precise, what I really mean by this is just a notion of statistical consistency. So we're going to consider settings where n and d, that is the number of samples and the number of features grow together, and we're going to try and identify conditions under which either of these um, error functions goes to zero as the number of samples goes to infinity. Cool. Um, so I'm kind of main finding in this over parameterized setting is that it is possible to find high dimensional settings in which a regression task would not work in the sense of statistical consistency, we would not get the regression test error to go to zero as n goes to infinity, but the classification setting would in fact work. So we would be able to get classification test error going to zero as n goes to infinity. So in essence, what we're able to find is a kind of asymptotic separation between the nature of the two tasks. So there are settings in which regression does not work, but classification does. There is some historical evidence here of uh, classification being somewhat easier than regression. And you'd kind of expect it in a certain sense, like the zero one loss is kind of a more benign metric, but in more traditional work, this has been shown in more low dimensional settings and from a more non-asymptotic, like the difference is more in terms of the error rates as a function of n. So here we really show that in the over parameterized setting, the difference can be really very stark and it can be asymptotic. Sometimes one task will not work and the other will. So now let's kind of make that um, the sense in which they're easier a little bit more precise. Uh, so the, we're going to actually state our results in the context of the bi-level feature model that we introduced um, a few minutes ago. And uh, we're going to look at the kind of classification and regression error um, and what it looks like as n goes to infinity um, as a function of this kind of ratio um, between the two sets of features in the model. So um, the work by Bartlett et al. essentially shows that as long as this ratio grows much faster than a d over n, that is the level of over parameterization, then a regression task would generalize quite well. And uh, you can see a kind of illustration of what good generalization and regression looks like in our kind of one dimensional Fourier feature example. So in this figure, the true function is the step function and uh, it's marked in orange and the recovered function is kind of marked in green. And you can see that this was doing pretty well from the point of view of regression. Um, it's kind of real values are very close to the true function fit almost everywhere. So what we were able to show is that there's kind of an intermediate regime 
in which the ratio um, does not grow as fast as d over n, but it grows faster than square root of d over n. And what we essentially showed is that in this intermediate setting, as we send d and n to infinity together, um, the regression task no longer works. And you can kind of see that in the figure that I've kind of showed over here, where the green recovered function is really very, very far away from the orange function. But in fact, classification will still work. So you can see exactly uh, how that's happening in the green function part over here, um, where the kind of the real values are very far away from what they should be. So regression is bad, but you're still getting the sign of the prediction right. And uh, our main result kind of shows this formally. It shows that there's this separation and the separation is not just a finite sample effect, it actually persists as n goes to infinity. Um, I'll also mention that our kind of results for classification are completely sharp in the sense that we have matching upper and lower bounds for minimum to norm interpolation. Um, and therefore, we were also able to characterize what happens when this ratio is uh, significantly smaller than square root of d over n. So this includes the isotopic uh, case as well. And in this situation, you can see that neither regression nor classification would generalize, and you'd really be making a lot of errors regardless of which of the tasks you decided to take carry out. I have a question, Vidya. Mm -hmm. um, so in the classification setting, how is uh, your beta estimated? Great question. So um, I'm just going to go back a couple of slides. I'm going to go back one slide and uh, kind of refresh that again. So in the classification setting, um, this is our generative model for the data. Um, like I said, this is flexible. We can also handle um, kind of standard logistic noise models as well. Um, but the actual estimator that we're choosing, just like in regression, is a minimum to norm interpolation. Um, so, uh, like I mentioned, because your training data matrix A is still full rank, um, you can still you're still capable of interpolating binary labels, um, and you can look at all candidate solutions such that A beta hat equals Y. And uh, what we're really evaluating here is the solution that minimizes the two norm of its weights, subject to perfectly fitting the data. And again, just like in regression, this is also something you can, you have a closed form expression for this as well. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm curious about that because in regression, it's a limiting case of ridge regression. Um, is it the same here? Yeah, or... it, would be, it, would be, it would be a limiting case of ridge regression. Um, and you would also get this uh, if you were to, if basically if you can think of it like if you were going to minimize the squared loss, like if you if you wanted to minimize the least squared error of uh, just with binary uh, binary valued outputs. Um, and I understand this is a kind of a non-standard thing to do in classification, um, which is what I think is kind of interesting about this. Um, but it is an estimator you can, in principle, compute and study. And if you maybe you wouldn't have a closed form solution, but if you wanted to use a different loss, can you s still do that? And, and does your theory question. still hold? Great question. So we are gonna see that our theory still holds, but it's gonna be uh, kind of indirect. So the end of my talk is gonna get to that. Okay. Yeah, we can handle, the short answer is we can handle some loss functions, but there are also loss functions where things are open here. So Vidya, yeah. I have a question for yeah. your uh, plot that you showed the uh, the boundaries of so that was for this particular minimum two norm interpolation yes uh, but is that also carry over to if i broaden the question to any algorithm that i throw in would it still have that type of would the boundary still hold as in if i were then to sort of have a thought experiment where i can choose any any method in some sense I don't know if that's easy to formulate as a problem, but would those boundaries still hold that beyond this scaling, you'll never be able to do classification and, and beyond this? Yeah, that is a, that's a good that's a good question. Um, in in some settings, yeah. So so for example, if you if you look at if you so a lot of the kind of separation here is um, also because. Uh, the of the some particular issues that arise with the minimum L2 norm solution in the regression setting. And that's one reason the separation here is so dramatic. Um, but it is true that the benignness of the zero one loss in the setting is a more general, is a more general property. 
Um, and if and if you and if you were to kind of instead look at a minimum L1 norm solution, it's not clear you'll see this asymptotic difference, but you would definitely see a difference in the error rates. Um, you would see that you would be able to um, get a lower error rate as a function of the number of samples in the case of classification than regression at the very least. Um, whether this asymptotic separation happens is not something that I'm as uh, certain about. It's a good question. Thank you. And I'll also say that in some related models, um, like for, for example, in mixture models that actually are lower bounds that uh, turn out to match the upper bounds here. Um, and there's some kind of concurrent work by uh, Chatterjee and Long that actually looks at that case. Thank you. One more question. I, I guess the, um, in the classification setting, the definition of interpolating is the same as regression. In other words, you want your function to pass through, you kind of view it as a classification as a regression problem. But you yeah. can imagine, um, you can imagine a different definition of interpolating, which is just zero training error. That right. might make more sense. Um, I mean, to me that, that would be, you know, interpolating isn't really that important in classification, right? It's a zero training error that sort of signifies that, overfitting. I, so I just wonder if any of the, if anyone's looked at that and if any of the theory changes. Yeah, that's a, so I feel like, okay, great. These are great questions. Um, and, and you're kind of right that the definition of interpolation and classification might make more sense if we look at like a hinge loss function or cross entropy loss or something like that. Um, I guess one takeaway of the results I'm going to present here is actually that all of these do reduce to the same type of solution. So something I'm going to show you a few slides from now is that if you were to look at, say, the hard margin SVM, which actually does interpolate in the sense that you define, right? Like it achieves zero training error on the hinge loss. Um, we're actually going to see that that um, with very high probability also does interpolation in, in like you're saying, this very non-standard sense. Um, so. I, I think it definitely makes sense to study all of these separately. Um, but the result I'm going to present here is that actually all of these notions of interpolation kind of, in a certain sense, seem to be coinciding um, in this very high dimensional setting. Um, but, uh, you know, hold that question. I, I, it would be nice to come to that, come back to that question maybe at the end of this talk. And I'm happy to say more about it. Thanks. Yeah, I think we can proceed maybe. Yeah. yeah, happy again, happy to say more about this um, at the end of the talk. Because yeah, it, it's it's a very natural question. Uh, cool. So uh, maybe just to kind of um, dig into the our first result here from the point of view of generalization, um, I'm just kind of refreshing some of the details of the kind of bi-level uh, bi covariance over here. Uh, just to recap, a very simple covariance matrix model where we have uh, two different candidate values for the features. The first S are very high and the next D minus S are very, very small. Um, and the intuition here is that the larger the ratio between the two feature values, um, the easier it is to preserve signal in the problem. Um, and a kind of key feature here, um, which is really at the heart of the regression results by Bartlett et al, is that if we have many of these kind of low value um, kind of features, um, this type of a model will always interpolate noise in a harmless way. Uh, the other kind of assumption we're gonna make on the signal here is one of a known sparse model. Um, that is that the signal is really only present in the first S components and uh, the intuitive idea again is that the first S components are the ones that are really going to be prioritized by L2 minimization. And uh, we really don't want too much signal in the kind of tail components. Um, and again, a recent paper by Siglund Bartlett shows in a certain sense that this assumption is kind of necessary um, to achieve statistical consistency. So um, what I'm not gonna show you is a kind of a very classical picture um, from what we might expect from the point of view of regression error. Um, and I'm going to consider it kind of for a special case of one sparsity, just for illustration purposes. So um, the black kind of arrow here represents the true signal. Um, and when we look at the components of the recovered signal, that is beta hat, uh, we can kind of really split up its effects into uh, two key parameters. 
um, the first one is the proportion of the true signal that was kind of preserved. Um, and that's kind of what's marked in the blue arrow over here. And this is kind of uh, what we call a survival component. And uh, ideally, we'd like this to be kind of as large as possible, as close to um, the true signal. We'd like it to be as close as possible to one. On the other hand, we have the kind of sum of the squares of the components of the signal arising from uh, other components. Um, and we call this a kind of contamination variance. Um, and you can really spiritually think of this um, as akin to the type of error terms that we get from fitting pure noise in the problem. So a very standard decomposition here is that the regression error is just going to be like uh, 1 minus SU squared plus CN squared. Um, and what this is saying is that regression error will be very, very low if, our, uh, if we are kind of preserving the true signal. So if SU is close to 1 and if CN is very close to 0. Um, and this is actually something you can kind of plug into um, in, in this kind of special case of bilevel covariance and a kind of special case of the results by Bartlett et al. Um, essentially gives you sharp upper and lower bounds for the test mean squared error in a regression setting. And really kind of unraveling those expressions, you see that the ratio needs to be large enough to ensure that we're able to preserve signal and guarantee that the test MSC would in fact go to zero as n goes to infinity. And uh, the precise scaling that's actually needed here is that we need R to be growing faster than B over N. So we need this ratio to really be pretty, pretty large. Um, something I'm going to say at the end of this talk is that this is also kind of what is needed for um, data macro complexity based bounds or bounds based on the training data margin in classification settings. Um, the same scalings are needed for those bounds to also be predictive. Um, but that's a point I'll return to again at the end of the talk. So maybe the key takeaway here is that for regression, we really need both of these things to work individually. We need the signal to be fully preserved and we need the components in the kind of orthogonal components to be very, very small. So now in the setting of classification, as you might expect, uh, the zero one loss is really a lot more benign. Um, and at least for the case of Gaussian data, uh, you can actually get this kind of very exact expression for the classification error which now actually looks at the ratio between these two effects. And the kind of key observation over here is that um, in this kind of setting, we actually can tolerate situations in which the true signal is really not that preserved. So in fact, we can deal with situations where the SU factor is much, much smaller than one and maybe even can go to zero as n goes to infinity. As long as the rate of that decay is slower than um, the kind of rate of decay of the contamination. So what really matters is the ratio between these two terms. And in principle, we could have scalings like, you know, maybe SEO goes to zero, like n to the alpha, and CN goes to zero, like n to the beta. And as long as alpha is greater than beta, then, you know, the, the ratio would still go to infinity and we'd get classification at a close to one. So what's really at the heart of this is, um, you know, more high level is that we do not need to perfectly preserve the signal to achieve perfect classification accuracy. As long as um, the effect is kind of not outweighed by the effect of falsely discovered features, we can still achieve very good classification performance. And uh, this kind of qualitative effect turns out to be kind of at the heart of our main result. And the kind of upshot of it is that we're able to show that classification does in fact work um, on if and only if the ratio between the two feature weights is growing faster than square root of d over n, which is smaller than d over n, since we are in the over parameterized setting. And again, this kind of qualitative observation of the benignness of zero one loss goes a, a while back. And what we really do here is leverage that together with these kind of harmless interpolation findings to show this very sharp separation between the nature of the two tasks. So um, in summary, um, what we characterized in our work were three regimes for uh, the ratio between the two feature weights. And we characterized the asymptotic classification test error for all of these cases. Um, although I'll note that we also have non-asymptotic bounds that are matching in their upper and lower bounds. Um, and we, you know, the kind of most interesting regime here is really this kind of separating regime between classification and regression. I'll also mention that there's been some follow-up work, um, particularly for the case of mixture models that uh, shows these same conclusions. And we also have some new results for the multi-class case, um, but I'm not gonna talk about those in too much detail. <laughs>
So um, since there's been, since there are a lot of questions about loss functions, um, what I want to do for the next uh, five minutes or so is kind of go to um, that part of the talk. Um, and there's really a sense in which these types of um, interpolating solutions with the minimum two-norm interpolation is kind of a non-standard object. In classification, minimizing the squared loss is not a very standard thing to look at. Uh, so now we're going to see uh, what all of our results might say about a more popular estimator used in classification. So with, with the, yeah. There was a question in the audience saying, uh, does the way you index the features matter for this type of result you hold? Yeah, good question. Um, so we do need the signal. We, we do need this, you know, because it's kind of minimum two norm and there's really a very limited sense in which minimum two norm is a good idea in high dimensional settings. We do need the signal to be um, of a known sparsity type. So it, we need the signal to have most of its energy in the top S components. Um, but other than that, we, we don't need very strong assumptions on the feature features themselves, if that makes sense. Right. That was, I think that was fine. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so, okay, so the last thing I'm going to talk about um, is kind of looking at the same type of classification model. Um, now we're going to study an estimator that's kind of um, more popular and more standard in the context of classification. Um, and this is the hard margin linear SVM. So this still has a minimum do not bias, um, but it's now subject to this kind of more classification specific interpolation constraint. So this is a hard margin constraint. Um, you can view this as an interpolation constraint on the hinge loss, right? So you can clearly verify that if you satisfy these constraints for all the training examples, then your hinge loss would be driven to zero. So a few things I'm gonna say about the SVM, uh, just, just for context, uh, Note that the feasible solutions here do actually include uh, what I've been talking about as an interpolation of binary labels. So if you just set all of these inequalities to equalities, um, and then you took, you multiplied both sides by yi, then you would get phi of xi transpose beta equals yi, which is precisely uh, interpolation in the sense that we were defining it. So this does include the minimum do not interpolation, but in general, these can be kind of different. Um, a couple of other contexts, uh, you know, one very natural way in which uh, this kind of hard margin SVM arises is like basically if we ran gradient descent on uh, the last layer of a neural network um, using the cross entropy loss or using the logistic loss, uh, then the kind of whole line of work on implicit bias actually tells us that this is the solution that we would actually get to. Um, the other thing I'll say about this is actually that. Um, while there exists a lot of classical analysis for the SVM, especially in terms of rather macro complexity and margin bounds and a uh, fraction of support vectors, uh, none of those analyses are actually predictive in the regime we want to study. I'll say more about that at the end of the talk. Um, and to really kind of sharply analyze the SVM is in general pretty difficult because beta hat is not a uh, closed form. So in general, beta hat does not have a closed form expression unlike the case of minimum two norm interpolation. So our kind of main result over here um, was to actually show that these uh, two solutions exactly coincide in these very, very high dimensional setups with high probability. Um, and the figure over here, um, this is the last figure of the talk, uh, really kind of illustrates that. Um, and what we've done here is we've considered this kind of, uh, this Fourier feature example, um, and we look at a covariance matrix in which the eigenvalues are decaying, but at a relatively slow rate, like one over square root of J. And the figure here shows that the least norm interpolation, which is marked in green, and the SVM, which is marked in red, exactly coincide. So our main result over here was to show that um, under a sufficient effective overparameterization in the feature model, um, and this is kind of captured by two notions of effective dimension on the spectrum of the covariance matrix. Uh, the hard margin SVM and the interpolation exactly coincide with high probability. So um, just to specialize, for example, to a D-dimensional isotropic uh, covariance case, uh, these conditions would basically reduce to D needing to be much greater than N multiplied by log N. Um, and actually we now know that this condition is tight as well uh, in some follow-up work 
but really the kind of uh, key takeaway here is that these solutions are exactly the same. And as a consequence of this, all of the analysis that we did for the case of interpolation actually carries over to the SVM as well. Um, also specializing this conclusion to the bilevel model, um, this kind of implies equivalence if the ratio is much less than B over N. So just to summarize some implications of uh, for generalization over here, um, earlier we saw that for the case of these kind of minimum plenum interpolating solutions, we saw the separating regime between regression and classification, where in this situation between square root of D over N and D over N uh, classification works, but regression does not. And we got all of these results for interpolation. Um, this kind of separate result that we've shown on equivalence of SVM and interpolation basically shows that all of these conclusions kind of carry over. And uh, what I find very interesting about these results is that they are actually predictive of good generalization outside of settings in which uh, bounds based, based on the Rademacher complexity would predict good generalization. And um, we have a full calculation and detailed explanation of this in our papers. Um, but the kind of idea is that the bounds based on Rademacher complexity only predict that classification test error would go to zero in this bilevel model if the ratio was greater than D over N. So the same setting in which we showed that regression works well. And in effect, we're able to show that the SVM can generalize well in regimes beyond those predicted by traditional bounds based on training data margin. Um, another kind of important set of techniques used to analyze the SVM includes um, bounds in terms of the fraction of support vectors. Um, and those bounds are also not predictive in our setting because effectively what we've shown is that all training data points are support vectors. So we really do need this connection of in to interpolation to really understand uh, why the SVM is generalizing well over here. Um, I would be happy to say a little bit about the proof technique, um, but I'm, you know, given how we are doing on time, I'm gonna save that for offline. Uh, maybe the last kind of more speculative thing that I'll say over here is that this has some interesting implications for the impact of various training loss functions, at least in a certain limited sense. So in a certain sense, we show that the hinge loss and the squared loss can give rise to the same types of interpolation um, in the setting in very high dimensional setups. And by making a connection to the implicit bias line of work, our results also imply that the squared loss and cross entropy loss actually give us the exact same solution. Um, and there's also some very recent uh, empirical evidence that's quite intriguing that the squared and cross entropy losses seem to be giving very similar performance in practice on neural networks. Of course, our theory is very, very far away from neural nets, but it is interesting to see, again, some of these similar phenomena happening across linear models and neural nets. Um, a very last thing that I'll mention is that all of these ideas with um, a good deal more amount of work also work for the case of multi-class classification. And a kind of interesting consequence over there is actually that uh, different formulations of the multi-class SVM, different optimization formulations turn out to also give rise to the same solution and all of these lead to interpolation in the sense that we have defined it. So I'm uh, a little bit over time. I'm gonna skip the proof technique for now, but uh, again, happy to say more about it offline. Um, what I'll do is end with a few takeaways. Uh, so for the first part of the talk, we showed that classification can be asymptotically much more benign than regression. And really the classification can work quite well despite a lot of things going against it. The very high dimensional nature of the problem, poor signals recovery and interpolation of noisy data. Uh, towards the end of the talk, we saw that the SVM actually perfectly fits the binary labels and the sense of function fit interpolation. And an interesting consequence about this is that different loss functions at training time actually can yield exactly identical solutions with high probability. And uh, all of these insights, you know, you know, if you actually look at through all the proof techniques of these, all of these use this newly discovered phenomenon of harmless interpolation of noise in a very direct way. Uh, just a little bit about future directions. Um, a lot of what I presented was for independent, like Gaussian feature models and the like. Um, recently, we have made progress in getting these to also work for like kernel methods. Something I'm interested in is understanding the adversarial letter. I have some preliminary work on this, but there's a lot more to do. Um, I said some stuff about loss functions. Our theory does not currently apply to um, polynomial decayed losses and you know, these kind of other types of loss functions. And I think it's very interesting to see if those give rise to different solutions in these high dimensional settings. 
And uh, of course, all of this is squarely within the purview of linear models, and it would be interesting to try and connect this back to deep nets. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, conclude and happy to stay back to take any questions. Let's thank Vidya. If there's time for one question, maybe you can go there. I have to leave soon, so I'm going to be ending the seminar soon, unfortunately. Sounds because good. Take care. So, <laughs> those... hi, Vidya. I have a question about the uh, uh, hard margin SVM part. Um, so, the figure you showed uh, reminded me of the um, the work of uh, Belkin, Rocklin, Sibokov. Uh, so, it it looks to me kind of like a kernel smoothing. Uh, fit for, for the data. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think there's a, some connection between these? Like, like are the, so for that case, the support vector machine coefficient will be all identically to one. So like in, in, in the case that you observed, do you think there's some connection? Like do the weights, are they sort of uniform? Is this approaching some kind of kernel smoothing method or uh, what's your thought on that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's actually something that it's something that I've been, I guess, wondering about. Um, I will say that there's a sense in which the kernel smoothing methods are more um, local, if that makes sense. Um, and things like minimum two norm interpolation and like the SVM are kind of more, uh, more global in the sense that um, I'm trying to think of a good way to say this. I, I guess like I guess what you can do is like you know since we know through the through the kind of dual formulation of the of the SVM we can actually kind of write our weights in terms of um, uh, like kind of the the weights in the support vectors. Um, what ends up happening is that the kind of uh, these fractions effectively or or I guess oh sorry if you look at the if yeah if you look at the recovered function form what you can do is you can kind of um write it as a sum of alpha i times kind of the kernel of x and x i right like this is this is actually a decomposition that we know happens for both the svm and for like non-parametric kernel smoothing techniques um but there's some kind of differences in the ways that we that we actually construct these and um yeah there's there's kind of a sense in which the singular kernels that Belkin, Zaklin, and Sipakov study are a bit different in nature from the um, from the types of coefficients we get from the SVM. Um, this is what I remember off the top of my head. But um, I, I, that being said, I think there is some connection between the harmless interpolation phenomenon in these two cases. It's just not something that I think I've made precise mathematically. It's a great question, too. All right, so sorry, but I think it may, could be, I mean, I just need to leave, so I'm gonna to have to end the seminar now. Sorry about that. But um, yeah. if any questions, um, Vidya has some time tomorrow, if you can email her and you can try to meet with her. Right, so yeah, let's thank um, her again. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Albert. Thanks very much. Thanks, bye.